My name is Nancy Stutz, and I'm with Connect Network, and I have the privilege of welcoming you this morning. It's been 10 years since a group much like this one got together down at Ebenezer Baptist Church to ask what we could do with technology to make the nonprofit sector stronger. That morning, the idea for Connect Richmond was born. Uh, many of us didn't have email, uh, but, but from that point, we've managed to get here in, in 10 short years. And I think this offers a unique opportunity for nonprofits. Uh, it also offers some, uh, we'll also hear about some, some cautions in terms of the way you use your time. The theory behind Connect Network, which some of you uh, were, were in that original group, uh, came up with what was that uh, online social networks that were place-based offered great opportunities for local change. What we also know is that widely dispersed, wide-reaching networks offer opportunities for innovation that tighter networks cannot. So while we know a few things, there are a lot of things we don't know. We're only beginning to see the impact of these and other technologies to create awareness, encourage action, and sustain momentum. We are also seeing social media's limitations. This summer, Connect Network has been funded by the Community Foundation and the Knight Foundation to begin research on how we can get people out from behind their computers, away from their iPhones, uh, and into the streets. One key factor is already emerging, and that is that leadership is critical. Anyone can put up a Facebook page become a fan of their favorite cause, or tweet about a meeting. But with, without a call to action, motivating communication, demonstrated commitment, and most important, follow through, these tools, these, these tools fall short of delivering the larger promise of technology. Our hope for the session today is that the civic organizations in this room can begin to think about how we can further our missions and most importantly transform our community in positive ways. One of the outcomes of the research grant we have is to rework Connect Richmond, Connect Southside, and Connect Rappahannock in ways that we can incorporate not only uh, the new, newer t interactive t technologies, but also the motivators that will move people out. So as you have ideas about that, um, we're going to put a group of people together, and anyone who is interested, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I get to thank everyone, and first of all, thank you for coming. I'd like to to thank the planning committee, uh, who worked very quickly and furiously uh, to put this together. And I, I do think that Sue, Sue Robinson Sane, who hates to have any credit given to her, uh, should, should receive a, a, applause because she... <laughs> she she takes an idea and she runs with it and it happens. And uh, it's, it's uh, an amazing thing to watch. Uh, and the rest of us get to enjoy the benefits. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Social Media Club of Richmond. Many of their members are providing the expertise today. Thank you to all of the presenters. And most importantly, thank you to the Jepson School and the University of Richmond, which is providing the leadership and the funding for our session today. We have a full agenda, so before we get started, I have some notes. 
In the interest of time, we won't be introducing the speakers in detail. All of their bios are in, uh, in your packets. The coffee will be out until 10 a.m. Uh, there, there will be a break both before and after the panel. Connect Southside is hosting a satellite event in Hopewell. Welcome to our conferees in Southside, Virginia. Can we wave to them? <laughs> The event is live on the web if you'd like to let colleagues know to tune in. Later today, you will be able to watch it on YouTube, although you're here, so I don't imagine you will. Uh, because we are recording, we ask that you address your uh, questions and comments through a microphone. If you are on Twitter, use the tag SM4SG so we can show your comments on the big TVs up front on the screen. Thank you again for being here today. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Sandra J. Pert, who is the Dean of the Jepson School of Leadership Studies. The Jepson School often convenes community conversations like this one on key leadership topics. The community is very appreciative of that outreach. Sandra's conversation will put today's meeting in, in its larger context. Sandra? Thank you. I'm gonna start by welcoming you again to the University of Richmond and especially to the Jepson School of Leadership Studies. I'm so pleased that you're all here. Um, as I've been thinking about this for the last few weeks, um, I've been really struck by the fact that we're talking about social media, we're gonna talk about Twitter and Facebook and all of these things where we don't need to be in a room uh, to use them, and yet uh, the good idea that we had uh, several months ago, and you're right, Nancy, uh, that it wasn't long ago that we first started talking about this, uh, was that it'd be really interesting to bring you all together to talk face-to-face -face about this stuff we do that's not face-to-face. -face. And so um, I think that's, that's a key part of, uh, of why this idea was such a good one. Um, I would reiterate um, Nancy's thanks to the planning committee and especially to Sue uh, Robinson uh, and Ryan Sp Smart as well uh, for the good work that they did very quickly to pull this tremendous idea together. Um, and uh, let me just say that sometimes I hear an idea and I, I know right away that it's a good one and, and this is one of those that I, as soon as I heard it, I thought, yeah, of course we need to do that and we also need to do it soon uh, because um, you know, pretty soon this will be sort of old hat or at least uh, other people will have done it and, and Jepson um, as a school always likes to be out there in front of the curve a little bit. And, and so we did want to do this during the summer, even though it's an odd time to come to an academic ca campus um, and to pull people together because it seemed uh, important uh, that we do it uh, quickly. And that is to say soon. So welcome to all of you. I would note that you're an extraordinary audience. Um, uh, I've looked around uh, just this morning to um, noticed that, uh, and uh, um, but I also know from you know, looking at the invitation list and the registration list uh, that two thirds of you are the heads of nonprofits, um, CEOs, or some similar position, and that I think is extraordinary. Um, and what we're trying to do uh, with this conference is to help you in the work, the important work that you do going forward. Uh, as Nancy said, you know, s th some of this has happened so quickly over the last few years um, that uh, we haven't had a chance to sit down and deliberate and think about just how it is that we might best use some of these new tools that are available. I'm here to talk very briefly I'm not going to get in the way of this conference because I'm not uh, an expert on social media, but I did want to say a few things about um, some of the challenges and interesting opportunities that uh, these media uh, uh, offer for leadership. And so my theme will, broadly speaking at least, will be uh, leadership in this new, quote unquote, new world of social media. Uh, before I say too much more, I wanted to just ask uh, how many people and I'll just pick one of these uh, media, uh, Facebook. How many people ha heard about Facebook more than a year ago? More than three years ago? 
three and a half. <laughs> Just to give a quick visual impression of how quickly some of this has emerged, I wanted to say, uh, you know, that question 10 years from now will be like the question, do you remember your first computer? You know, and we all say, oh yeah, it was like this big, and, and uh, yeah, I got it, was, uh, I'm talking now personally, when I was a graduate student and I realized that I couldn't type my dissertation uh, on, a, on a typewriter because it had, I'm an economist, it had all these equations in it and I needed a computer that would do this mathematical notation. Uh, and I scrounged up the money <laughs> uh, and it was enormous uh, and it was, uh, you know, the purchase of my life at that point. Uh, I, I lived in Toronto, I'm a Canadian, I didn't own a car uh, because I lived in Toronto and you didn't need a car and so the, the computer was the biggest thing that I bought. Well, I would say that you know, Facebook or whatever, you know, whichever one we want to choose, and, and as I say, I could have uh, uh, you know, said Twitter or uh, LinkedIn or, or MySpace or whatever. Um, that will be, you will have questions like that or impressions or make statements like that. You know, I remember when I first started using this stuff uh, 10 years from now, and, uh, and it will be embedded in your lives the way the computer is now embedded in our lives. And so that was the first point that I wanted to make. Uh, it's, it's new, but it's not going to go away. It's not a fad. Uh, it's not simply, you know, stuff that kids do uh, and we as adults, uh, you know, can watch or sort of take part in on the margins. Uh, but this is something that will, I think, uh, persist. It may not all persist in the same way uh, uh, and, and so it will evolve over time. Uh, and, and some things will fall by the wayside side and others uh, will not. Just as some kinds of computer software you know, have fallen by the wayside and some others uh, haven't. As someone who uses and has used uh, off and on WordPerfect uh, much more than Word, you know, I've, I've been through this, the sort of variations in who uses what and which one, uh, you know, you need to use because other people are using them and so on. Uh, so things evolve, but, um, you know, the basic structure doesn't uh, go away. The other point I wanted to make is that when I first heard about Facebook, um, and, and I make this point it, uh, to, to show that it's a serious medium, uh, I was at an academic conference uh, and a hip young graduate student came up to me and said, you know, you really need to have a, you know, some sort of group on Facebook and, and I said, what? <laughs> you know, and of course, um, she was right, uh, that, that uh, this is a medium not only for uh, people to connect as friends, as relatives, but also in academia. And uh, so it had a serious purpose. And again, I'm an economist. Uh, when I go on Facebook, um, it's a major way to get news uh, for me. Uh, so that if there's an interesting blog, uh, if there's an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal, if there's you know this, this thing on Africa or that thing on uh, Obama's health care plan, uh, those will be linked on Facebook if, of course, you're connected to the right people and so on, and uh, so it can very much serve uh, an academic uh, uh, purpose, uh, especially in times now when news emerges from so many different sources and it's very hard for us to keep track of everything. Um, finding filtration mechanisms uh, is increasingly uh, important. So I wanted, though, to make a little bit of a transition and think a little bit with you about leadership uh, in these times or in the time when we have uh, now these social media. Uh, and I, I want to add that um, at the Jepson School, <coughs> rightly, I think, I wouldn't be there if I didn't agree with this, we conceive of leadership as influencing other people, influencing uh, conversations. And I want to stress two parts to that uh, notion. One is that there's some reciprocal uh, element to leadership so that there are people who are listening sometimes and talking other times or conversing other times. Uh, and so it's a two-way sort of relationship. Uh, and secondly, I want to say that uh, leadership uh, is social can't be a leader if you're Robinson Crusoe, or at least it's sort of a vacuous notion to think about that. Uh, and so uh, if, if leadership is about influencing conversations, uh, whether from a position of authority uh, or from a position uh, at a round table, as you're sitting uh, at, 
Uh, what do these new social media mean in terms of leadership going forward? Uh, and I want to add one other uh, piece to this. So we talk about influencing each other and leadership constituting the act of influencing each other. We do that, though, in a context. Sometimes we sit in a square room in a lovely setting such as this. I think it's square, but <laughs> whatever. In a room such as this. Uh, but there's a whole world outside of us in which we have these conversations. And it seems to me that two very important contextual things happened. I'll just use the technical economist term, things happened this year. Uh, to those kinds of conversations and then to leadership within them. Uh, the first is that, and neither of these has yet gone away, the first is that we are in the midst of a very serious recession, uh, something that matters to those of us who are both in the private sector and in the nonprofit sector. Uh, because it has, it, that recession means that fundraising uh, has now entered into a new landscape, at least for some time until uh, the world uh, improves <laughs> for us, and it'll be some time. Uh, and then the second is that there are technological abilities or uh, interfaces that exist all around us in which, uh, which sets, set the context for the conversations that we can have. So on the one hand, we have a very deep recession and some important economic things going on. And on the other hand, we have the, this evolution, seemingly spontaneous evolution, of new technology that, that enables many more conversations and different kinds of conversations to take place. Uh, so the context changed in the last, we'll say, three years, since most of your hands went down before, you know, once I mentioned three years. Within the last three years, the context has changed dramatically. On the one side, because of technology. On the other side, because of the economic context. Each of those pieces uh, then suggests or offers new opportunities uh, for us to shape our conversations. Um, I'll leave the economic times aside since we're talking here about um, uh, social networking. Uh, and just say then that, so what do we do about social networking, uh, about this new technology, if we want to shape conversations going forward? Uh, is this a paradigm shift or you know, something is, uh, that we might uh, use that sort of uh, uh, description for? Is it that significant going forward? Uh, let me just suggest a couple of the things that have happened uh, to our conversations. Um, this isn't planned, it's not in my speech, but let me just show you the dress that I'm wearing. <laughs> this dress, I bought it uh, online um, two months ago at about 12.30 at night from Coldwater Creek. <laughs> And I do pretty much all of my shopping online at about that time. Uh, it's when the workday ends, and uh, I rarely go into stores. Um, and, and uh, you know, that you may still go into stores, and I do occasionally as well. I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course. But uh, so much of our shopping has changed. Uh, much of the, um, the interactions, many of the interactions that we have, which used to involve some sort of middle person, a person to connect you with someone else. Uh, so you wanted to sell something, you place an ad in a newspaper. Um, that sort of transaction has largely changed. Uh, and we can self-initiate, now not we as leaders, but we as ordinary people, can self-initiate many more transactions uh, than uh, we used to. And it's good fun to some extent. I mean, some people love going on eBay. Uh, my co-author is a... a, a an inveterate shopper, um, and he, he has, uh, you know, probably a hundred Italian suits that he's bought on eBay. Uh, it's, <laughs> he just likes to get the bargains. <laughs> and uh, uh, traveling with him in Italy and, and with my family a couple of years ago, he was uh, astounded to see the real price, <laughs> the real price, <laughs> that is to say the, the uh, non-discounted price of these suits uh, in Italy. Uh, and so he actually didn't go close into any stores there, though he is a shopper. So, uh, so in some ways, we have, as leaders, 
one thing we might think about is that we've somehow lost control because there are so many self, more self-initiated um, transactions and conversations that can take place. Um, and I want to stress that that's both a challenge and an opportunity uh, for all of us. Um, I want to let you know that um, one of my staff members who wor was working on uh, this conference uh, went to a seminar on social media not too long ago and uh, in a room with nonprofit organizers, leaders, communications persons, um, the suggestion was made that uh, you know in order to, um, to, to help take advantage of social media, one of the solutions might be to hire an intern. Uh, and, you know, I think that's a fabulous idea. Uh, an intern would be able to actually probably, you know, set up the, the requisite pages and, and uh, accounts and so on as well as anyone. Uh, and so that, that's something that we can think about taking advantage of. Um, and as I say, you know, the person who told me about Facebook was a young, hip graduate student, of course. <laughs> But of course, you also want to take care because you want to control what your brand looks like going forward. And so, uh, though you may want someone young and, and able to do this, this to you know go out and make the pages and so on, you also want to be able to create the conversation in the sort of space that suits your particular nonprofit. Uh, and so, as I say, that's both a challenge and an opportunity going forward. Um, so what would I say about uh, some of these trends? Uh, first, it's not just social. It's social in the sense that it involves relationships, as leadership does as well. Uh, but it's not social in the sense that it's trivial or you know what we do for fun. It involves work. Um, in my case, academic work. In some of your cases, nonprofit work, and so on. Uh, it grew from uh, what the authors, co-authors of of uh, the book. Groundswell, uh, which is a already somewhat old book, 2008 <laughs> book, uh, uh, but uh, what they call the collision of three forces. People, technology, and economics uh, were the sort of driving forces for uh, this groundswell, as they call it. I, uh, I think as an economist in terms of competition and cooperation. I'm one of those kind of almost social psychologist kinds of uh, economists, I, and I teach competition, cooperation, and choice. Um, I would call it not so much collision as cooperation of those three uh, elements. So people, technology, and economics. People like to interact. Technology evolved to let them interact. Uh, it became cheap enough for them to use this technology Ergo, we now have this social media sort of world in which we're all functioning. And let me describe in part why the, the economics uh, is important. Um, so as I say, we all love to be in social relationships. And for some time now, uh, academics and commentators have talked about an erosion of social capital. And as they began to talk about that, it seemed to me that, that in fact, they were getting it a little bit wrong. Um, though we may not do interact the same way as we used to interact, um, we still have many interactions, uh, and they're meaningful. The days, though, of my parents and the Friday night bridge party have long gone away. That was a wonderful time. Uh, and they play bridge, you know, every other Friday with their friends, two tables of four, uh, and it was a, you know, a wonderful way for them to get together and interact, as I say, every couple of weeks. And they did business at these, you know, so it wasn't, again, just purely social. It was largely social, but there were important um, conversations taking place at those bridge parties. Uh, but since the 1960s, when those sorts of things might have uh, been feasible, uh, it's been the case that many more families have opted for two earners. My mother at that time wasn't uh, in the labor force. Uh, and uh, two earners on a Friday night uh, don't, don't exactly want to go home and get ready to have the bridge party. Um, and so it may be that they will opt to do something different on a Friday evening uh, than someone who had a much more idyllic life. Uh, I don't want to say that it was not a, that my mother wasn't working hard; she was, uh, but a different sort of life. Uh, and so, you know, the the social network 
world that we're now seeing is one in which we're reconnecting, or not reconnecting, but we're connecting uh, in different ways, but having similar kinds of conversations that people have always had. Within organizations, people are sometimes wary of what they don't know about uh, and fearful of change. And uh, so the idea of hiring an internship, giving up control about your communication or your image, uh, hiring an intern, uh, to someone who's not within the organization or not steeped in the organization, uh, can be something uh, that, that uh, is resisted within the organization. Um, one of the points I want to make about the emergence of these social media is that they have flattened the horizon or flattened the situation in which leadership uh, takes place. So if you think of groundswell, it's something coming from the ground sort of evenly. There's not a lot of hierarchy involved. I'd like to say, you know, supposing there is a hierarchy, uh, what has happened is that it's become flatter as a result of what's happened in the last five years. And that's a reality that those who are in charge of an organization simply uh, need to cope with and think about organ both organizationally and in terms of their leadership. Um, social media are uncontrolled, largely uncontrolled, uh, but I think that's, that's one of the tremendous benefits of them. So let me just talk a little bit more about that. Um, if you were to hire an intern, and I don't want to keep picking on interns, but hire some young person from outside the organization uh, in order to communicate uh, about the organization, uh, what you've just done then is sort of remove the notion of an expert within the organization who feeds the information out. Um, and I have a great uh, interest in expertise, so that's one reason I, I'm so thrilled about this conference. Um, but people have lots of talent, so we want to take advantage of the fact that you know, there is expertise out there. But we need to also realize that people have lots of talents and that if you take many people together and try to aggregate their talents or their information, their impressions, um, then there's a collective wisdom that can emerge which may in fact outweigh or be more uh, effective than any sort of top-down expertise uh, or expert uh, advice that someone can give us. So when, for instance, just to use the most obvious example that uh, has emerged recently, uh, when we get picture after picture and story after story about a so-called election and how a regime is clamping down uh, on those who are protesting the results of that election, uh, we find out then that people connected, in that case by Twitter, have a greater ability to inform the world sometimes uh, than experts did. In that case, of course, because at least in part, some of the experts simply weren't able to be there. Until now, I want to push this a little farther. Until now, the way that we've aggregated information, that we've tried to get information out of ordinary people like you and me, is mostly by using surveys, polls. We've spent billions of dollars in the last year on surveys. Not we, you know, in this room necessarily, but as, as a nation. Market surveys drive what people produce. They drive what you see on television. Uh, and they drive the sorts of dresses that Coldwater Creek will put for sale and so on. Most, many of those are fabulously designed and interesting surveys uh, and they yield good information. But there are enormous selection issues and framing issues associated with surveying. It's a very specific form of research, and as soon as you ask a specific question, even if you word it very carefully, you eliminate getting information about anything except that question. Right? So you just narrow the set of things that you can find out about to almost a null set, if you think in mathematical terms. Uh, and you know, it may be that that null set, or almost null set, is exactly what you wanted to learn about 
but it may be that it's actually a little bit beside what you really wanted to learn about, and people don't get to tell you that stuff to the side because you asked this question over here. Yeah. What something like Twitter does, and I, now I'll use Twitter uh, as the example, is that it allows for what you might think of as emergent inf information to be tracked in real time. And there is absolutely nothing like that that has existed before in the history of you know, personhood. Um, it lets people tell us, and because it's all uh, existent somewhere in cyberspace, it's trackable and it's aggregatable. It lets people tell us what they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're talking about. We've never had the ability to have data of that sort uh, before. And let me just say uh, you know, that if we're spending billions of dollars to collect data on a very narrow set of questions, and now free of charge pretty much, all of this other data opens up to us. Uh, for those of us like me in economics, uh, but also for you who in are interested in what people are thinking and doing and talking about, that's an enormous opportunity. So this flattening of the landscape, I think, is tremendously important uh, in terms of being able to save us information, save us, sorry, money, save us research efforts, and also get things right uh, in ways that we haven't always been able to get, it, get things right uh, in the past. Think about the number of television shows that have failed in the last five seasons, or even one season. Do you know how much it costs to mount a new television show? Do you know how much market research goes into figuring out which television show will be successful? That is an industry that surveys and surveys and surveys. And most of the time, they get it wrong. Right? Most television shows that emerge also disappear pretty quickly. Um, and so if it were the case that, and now I'm not suggesting that we necessarily are going to be able to re revolutionize television uh, production, but if it were the case that you could get that information more cheaply and more accurately, uh, wouldn't that be a tremendous world? So this is what I mean by this wonderful flattening and leveling of uh, the information world, the world in which we're all functioning. Uh, what these media let us do, and I'll leave you uh, with this message, uh, is allow us to see, as I say, in real time, what it is that people are thinking about, what they're talking about, what's important to them. Uh, and then we can aggregate that, uh, and of course that takes a certain amount of technical skill, but, but it's, it's of course feasible. Uh, and we can find out uh, what little slices of the population are interested in so that you know, we don't always want to know uh, what everybody is doing, but we may be able to find a market niche that's big enough for our organization to serve that particular niche. Uh, whereas using survey data, there's almost no possible way that you can find those niches because you need a sample size that's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of persons if your, your niche is only one in a hundred or one in a thousand or one in 10,000 persons. One in 10,000 persons is a big market if you know where all of those persons are. Yeah. So for you as leaders of organizations, let me just say that I think there are tremendous possibilities that this world opens up for you. Uh, and I want to wish you well in your conversations today. Uh, I think it's going to be a tremendous conference. And welcome again to the University of Richmond. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting my duties. I'm also supposed to say, um, move us on to the next part of the, the show. We're going to put a uh, video, uh, cue a video up just now. I wanted to just talk. I didn't think that it would be, you know, you'll have lots of video stuff coming up. Uh, but I also want to in, uh, let you know that uh, after this video, John will continue the conversation uh, with some very good remarks for you. Thanks.
hope I'm not supposed to answer that question. <laughs> um, while we're getting uh, the presentation up on the screen, and uh, hopefully it'll all work, um, one thing I need to do, um, I have been chastised for not having enough pictures on my blog. So if um, everybody on this side of the room can squeeze in, and everybody on this side of the room can squeeze in. Hang on for one second. We gotta make sure it works. Cool. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, scared yet? Uh, it's um, a personal story. Um, if anybody said seven months ago that I'd be giving this presentation to a group like this, I would have said they were crazy. Um, I, didn't, I started my blog about seven months ago and really dove into things like Facebook and Twitter and all of those things right about that time. So, you know, for anybody in the room who thinks that their organization can't do it or, you know, they're way behind the curve or those types of things, if I can do it, believe me, you can do it. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, for anybody who is on Twitter, that's my handle, would love you to follow me, it's at John New. Um, Sue asked me to give an overview of the social media landscape, so this is my favorite slide in the entire world. Um, okay, everybody take a look at that, and I'm done. So if there are any questions, no, only kidding. Um, I look at this as a clock, okay, so in the middle you see social media, um, at about at 12 o'clock are uh, blogs or things or platforms that you can use to publish blogs. So WordPress, TypePad, um, all wikis, all those types of things are things you can do to publish information. At one o'clock are all the things that you can use, all the platforms you can use to share things like video and photographs like Flickr or YouTube. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, at about four o'clock are the social networks or the things that, um, the platforms that we use to share information or to talk to each other. Um, and these are the most popular uh, platforms like Facebook, MySpace, and we'll talk about those in a second as well. Uh, Twitter is a micro blog, so you're blogging and sharing information. You can only do it at 140 characters at a time. Um, then you get into live streams like uh, feed, friend feed, uh, live casts like we're webcasting today, platforms like Ustream allow you to do that. And then you get into the funky stuff like uh, Second Life where you can, virtual worlds where you, if you don't like your life, you can have another one on the internet. So, uh, and that's where we sort of, I personally sort of draw the line, so. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's an overview of what we call social media today. But really when you think about it, you're not talking about communicating anything different than you were 10 or 20 years ago. You're just communicating those things in different ways through the use of technology. So whereas in the past I would pick up the phone and tell somebody something, I am now using Facebook. Where I would uh, put a photo album together and share it in front of your, with your family over dinner, I'm now posting those photos on Flickr so everybody, I can share them with everybody all at the same time. Uh, the same thing with video, you know, you used to take that family vacation and you would, uh, you know, get everybody together afterwards and put it up on, uh, on the screen. The same thing is happening right now um, for all of these, uh, you know, using things like um, Facebook and also uh, a lot of uh, YouTube and all those types of things. Um, Pew had a study recently, and uh, what they found out is that adults with profiles on social media platforms are uh, up from 8% to 35%. Adults are the largest percentage of people in the United States, so therefore there are more adults on social media platforms than teenagers. Think about that. It's not for the young people anymore. It's for all of us. Um, here's another good example, Facebook, in the last couple of months. Look at where all the growth is. Um, 35 to 65. That's where all the people are going. So again, it's not for young people anymore. 
Um, there is a UMass Dartmouth study of um, nonprofits, just like a lot of folks in this room. The largest nonprofits over the last couple of years have outpaced corporations and academic institutions like the one we're sitting in in the adoption of social media. So organizations like yours um, are setting the pace. 89% um, of charitable organizations are using social media in some form. So how many organizations represented in this room right now are using social media? See? 90% um, of, of charities say blogs are a great tool to, communi to communicate with. 80% say that blogs are, and social media is important to the future strategy of their organization. So think about that again. You guys are really sort of the early adopters, especially when you compare yourselves to the folks in corporate America, Fortune 500 companies. So what does that mean for you? So if you're currently using social media, um, and then you're in good company, but the question I would ask for you, and the one you're probably struggling with every day is, are you using that effectively? What are you doing? Just because you have a Facebook fa page, just because you're tweeting, are you doing the right things? Are you building community? If you're not, then you're really faced with the decision to either let the other folks in the room that are have a competitive advantage, or you can dive in just like I did seven months ago. Here's, you know, when we talk about social media, social media is really the sharing of, of information online or on the internet using all of these platforms. That's really, when you boil it down, that's what it is. So you're talking about social networks like Facebook, blogs and wikis, microblogs like Twitter, video and photo sharing like we talked about, message boards and forums, the ability to comment on, on other people's blogs, all of those types of things. Um, but what do you do? What are the philosophies? You know, what is the roadmap of what you're trying to communicate as an organization? Well, first of all, number one, you need to be transparent. In the post-Enron world, People want transparency. People want you to share accurate, transparent information with each other. They don't want you to lie, they want you to be honest. Uh, you need to be relevant. You need to give out good information. You need information that people can share, absorb, and then share with other people. Uh, you need to be consistent. Um, how many people are on Twitter regularly? And do you check to see what, how often other people are tweeting, especially people that, that are following you or you want to follow? Consistency is key. You need to be out there sharing in the um, conversation. You need to be honest, like I said. For nonprofits, you need to educate other people. How do you expect people to think that you are relevant if you're not sharing really good information? And Cynthia will talk about in a little bit what she is doing, and it's a great example of an organization that is sharing information so that other people can be educated and become ambassadors uh, for that organization. You need to provide value. You need to share not only in communicating about your organization, but communicating about other organizations and telling people you know, what's valuable about them as well. It's a true conversation, a true two-way street. For nonprofits, you need to engage and communicate with current stakeholders. This is a great way to re, you know, sort of get your arms around the troops again in a more vir virtual world and communicate with them and make sure you sort of shore up the base uh, because a lot of the base, as you have seen, is on there using these tools already. So if you're communicating with them in different ways, you need to communicate with them in these ways as well. Uh, encourage them to be ambassadors. A great example of this is what the American Red Cross is doing. Um, they have an online presentation that um, they share with all of their stakeholders and give them basic information so that they can go and be ambassadors for the organization as well. You know, you can find it easily online. Anybody from American Red Cross in the room? All right, I, I didn't believe me, it wasn't arranged. Um, Engage and educate with new audiences. I mean, that's, that's the thing here. You want to build your base after that. So see if there are people out there that you can uh, form relationships with and you can communicate with them as well. 
expand your community. And at least in the beginning, and this is Beth Kanner, who's one of the experts uh, on the subject. You can find her at, at Cantor on Twitter. Friend raise, not fundraise, at least in the beginning. You know, if the first thing you do out of the box is ask for money, then folks just, you know, aren't probably gonna respect you in the morning. So you need to go out there and really build your base and then decide how you're gonna engage with them afterwards. Uh, how do you build that base and how do you do that? How do you figure out where your people are? Well, you can do research. You know, you can ask your, already your stakeholders where they are because their friends are gonna be there too. So if most of your stakeholders are already on Facebook, that's a good place to start. Um, uh, social media, and it was alluded to earlier, should flow from a broader communication strategy so it shouldn't, what you're talking about shouldn't be different from what you're talking about on your website, where you're talking about in emails or in print materials. It should all flow the same way. It should start sort of top down. You want it to start top down and then give people the freedom to, uh, to communicate from there. The, um, that's where the communication strategy comes in. It should not replace other forms of marketing. That's what we preach um, to our clients. It's not like we're going to be on Facebook and we're going to stop doing the ad campaign. It's got to all come together. And it is not expensive, but it does take time. And for nonprofits, people, what some people don't understand, even though it's free, time is money for you as well. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So it's a two-way street. So which is fraught with peril for some people. Some people don't like it when you talk and somebody else talks back. But that's really what this is. It's a two-way conversation. You start a blog and you can't stop people from commenting. You uh, start talking on Facebook, you really should not control the conversation that comes back. If you're scared of it, well, people are already talking about you anyway. <laughs> you just don't want to listen. Uh, we have a client, it was the, nobody in this room, <laughs> and it was uh, the last person I ever thought that would get it. But what he said was, the reason why we like social media is because of that feedback, and it helps us gain knowledge for us to do better as an organization. It get, gives you that information that you need to become a better organization. So, even though you should watch yourself, you know, you should try to embrace this idea of two-way communication because that's the only way this is going to work. So here are some examples. Uh, this is a blog by Bill Marriott, the head of Marriott Hotels. So, you know, one of the philosophies, and it's harder for nonprofits sometimes, is to have the head person in the organization be the person who blogs. Uh, nonprofits, sometimes they like to share in the number of people just based on time and effort and money. It's okay if you have a couple of people blogging. You know, you should have people in your organization from, from different, that represent different parts of your organization to keep it fresh. But, you know, this is information about the company. He gets comments. He responds back to comments. It's a free-flowing uh, type of conversation. Um, here's the, this is an example, anybody who's never seen a MySpace page, people think MySpace is going away. It's still good for younger audiences. Um, somebody, if everybody's, uh, Facebook's getting everybody older, the young people have to be somewhere, so this is what that looks like. One of the great advances in social media, I think, in the last couple of months was the redesign of the Facebook fan page. Because what it allowed people to do is communicate in the stream in the middle, and anybody who's a fan sees every post that's posted there. So think of that. The more fans you have, you can instantly communicate immediately with all the other people who are fans of yours. Think about the power of that. And it wasn't built that way before. Twitter, um, great example. The CEO of Zappos, who is uh, looked upon as uh, one of the great Twittering CEOs, not because he's prolific, because he tells you exactly what's going on in his company. And for anybody who doesn't think that's powerful, remember, he just sold his company to Amazon for $800 million this week. So if, if Amazon had a problem, that probably wouldn't happen. Um, this is my LinkedIn. 
Uh, LinkedIn for me is more of an online Rolodex. Some people really get into LinkedIn. It's a good way to, to connect, it's a good way to uh, get groups of people together to communicate with. So it's, it's uh, good for nonprofits. It's a good way to look and network to find a new job uh, that a lot of people use it for. This is like God's YouTube page. <laughs> you know, it's good enough for the Pope, <laughs> but it's a great way to share um, uh, videos and information uh, and post all your stuff. And it's a great way to share information about your organization and have your ambassadors take that information in the video form and share it with other people. You know, the creation of a branded YouTube channel is a great way to do that. Um, Flickr, a great way to, sh to share pictures. If you are an organization that has chapters all over the country, all, all over the state, get your people to post pictures and share, and it, it, it's a great way to keep your, your organization and your community communicating with each other. So these are some of the examples, but what do I do? Which way do I go? Where do I start? You know, how can we you know, get this ball rolling? Well, the first thing that comes up in any organization is people that tell you you can't do it. How many people have had that experience in their organization? Okay. So here are the top five reasons not to do any of this. Okay. The fear of the negative, as we talked about before. Ooh, no, I get people will comment. They'll say bad things on my blog. Oh, it's terrible. Um, how many lawyers are in the room? Okay. Um, the lawyers sometimes get in the way, maybe not these lawyers. Time, it takes too much time. We don't have anybody to do it. Who's gonna blog? When are we gonna have time to Facebook? Um, ROI, how do we measure the return on investment on all that time? Because we can't at least logically equate it to dollars or something. And then how do we measure this? You know, how do I know that this is sort of a plus B equals C, and we'll see some sort of nifty graphic that will show you that it's worth all the time, money, and effort we're putting into this. So let's get over the humps. Um, you know, you can decide that you don't want to see the negative, but the negative is happening, happening all around you with you or without you. So, you know, what's the difference between people talking behind your back or saying something to your face? If, you, if they say it to your face, you can deal with it. You can enter into that conversation, you can talk to them about it, and sometimes you can flip them. And, you can, and when that flip happens, it's more powerful than anything else. Because you've converted somebody, and not only that, everybody else sees that you've converted somebody, and you get credit for that. Um, it also, for all the legal people, blogs are a great way to respond directly at time of crisis. So just think about it. Um, in the old days, if somebody, if a newspaper reporter wrote something bad about your organization, you'd open it up in the paper, you'd have a meeting, you'd decide what you were going to do about it. You would write a letter to the editor. In three weeks, the letter to the editor would appear. You would have, you know, to wait for those three weeks to happen and deal with all of your constituents. In the blog world, you can say in a meeting, okay, let's respond, and in an hour, get a blog response back up, and send the blog response to the reporter and link it back to the story on the comment section of the online newspaper. So you just condensed the crisis into no crisis. Um, on the ROI part, start slow and build. Have reasonable goals, and we'll talk about that in a second. You know, set your goals, at least at the beginning, not in terms of money, but in terms of friends and followers and how you're gonna build your community on a slow and steady basis. And Graydon had a great point last night at Social Media Club. It's, you know, you can not measure social media in terms of days and weeks, but it's really months and over the course of a year or so to really build your community before you might even ask them to do anything. Um, because you really want them invested in your organization and ready to do things for you and properly educated to at, then ask them to do something after that. Here's an example. There are a lot of tools when you talk about measurement. There are two companies that I'm familiar with and there are tons more. One is called Radiant 6 and one is called Techergy. 
And for less than you would think, they have the ability now to measure social media um, and put your company's information in and measure it in terms of tonnage, in terms of here, it, it's, they actually can um, take a look at tone. So if they will be able to tell you who's saying what about you and whether they're saying something positive, negative, or neutral. If I clicked on that in real, on Techrigy, on SM2, which is the name of the platform, it would also tell me who said it. Not only that, it would tell me whether I, I should care because it would tell me they have a way of measuring what kind of influence that person or that blogger has in the social media sphere. So there are ways now to measure social media that never existed before. So how do I start? Um, for my birthday at work, they gave me access to the, to the image file, so I've been having a lot of fun with that. Um, uh, anyway, the first thing you should do, and what a lot of people tell you to do, the first thing to do if you're getting started, or even if you're involved in it already, is listen. You can do Twitter searches for your organization and see who, people are gonna be talking about you whether you want them or not. We've proven that for our clients and we've surprised them. Just by doing a Twitter search, they're probably talking about your organization. You can do Google searches, you can do Google blog searches, you can see what your competition is doing or not doing, so you'd have a really good way of, of figuring that out. Like I said before, listen to your stakeholders. They're the ones that are gonna tell you whether they're predominantly on Facebook, Twitter, you know, uh, MySpace, and then once you figure out where they are, then see what other people are doing, start thinking about engaging in conversations, and then decide to stake your claim and start communicating with your constituency. Most importantly, once you start to decide what you're doing, let your constituency know you are there. Tell them you, you, they can, that you're on Facebook, tell them you're on Twitter, let them know where they can be found. 